Well, there are big issues at play here, big money, a lot of emotion at stake. We'll be hearing in a few moments' time from Maurice Lindsay, the chief executive of the Rugby Football League, from John Wilkinson, the chairman of Salford, and his counterpart at Widnes, Jim Mills, and from Joe Lydon, the assistant coach at Wigan. We'll also be dropping in at one club in particular, and that's Keithley, where they're far from happy, and our reporter there is Damien Johnson. Well, here in Keithley, there's broad support for the Super League, but there's anger among fans because their side hasn't been included uh, among the elite 14, despite the fact that they've won promotion almost from the existing second division. There's been a passionate public meeting here tonight. We'll be talking to some of the many fans who've uh, stayed behind tonight later in the programme. Well, let me ask you, Maurice Lindsay, straight away, why this revolution? I think after 100 years, everybody knows that we're still struggling. We haven't really made the advancement that we should have done. And if you have a look at the... Um, FA Premier League, they took a similar decision just two or three years ago and they're really leaping ahead. New stadiums, a new excitement, and whether you like soccer or you don't, you have to admire the concept as a truly successful one. We think our game is tremendous. Everyone who watches our game is in love with it. But for some reason, we can't get it watched by millions. This gives us the opportunity to put the game on a firm footing financially. It also gives us the opportunity to expand totally in a way that we want to do for 100 years but haven't been able to. Okay, well, bef before I bring in the others of our guests here to, to, to debate the issue, what about this money? We're hearing sums of 50 million, maybe up to 80 million pounds. Where will that money go? It must go to develop the game, its stadiums and its grassroots. Obviously, the players are entitled to be paid. They are uh, total professionals and I don't think anyone denies people like Ellery Hanley have done so much for our game, Dennis Betts who's doing something for our game now, young Jason Robinson. No one denies they're making a career out of rugby league. I want them to be full-time professionals. That's the only way that the paying spectator will see the best of them. But basically, the money must go into the game to improve the facilities for spectators and to make it a truly dynamic competition. OK, well, let's move to one of the most controversial elements of this whole package, and that is the question of mergers between the various clubs. And bring in John Wilkinson, the chairman of Salford, whose club is one of those which will merge with Oldham to become the new Manchester club. John. How can you accept the destruction of the tradition of Salford in this way? Well, Salford, of course, is right in my art. I mean, I've been chairman 13 years, and I think I've done a good job for Salford. But I can't do any more than I've done in the 13 years. The game has been lacking money from the base. There's not enough money coming from the base of the game. And but I is, feel But is no. this the only way? Is, is merging with another club the only way forward? If it is the only way forward, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to go. I can't think of any other way. Uh, this is a, an exciting time for Rugby League. I just hope that we can find the answers with Oldham. I know there will be resentment from both sets of fans, but uh, we've got to look positive to the future. Jim Mills, alongside your chairman of Widnes, you also are having to lose your identity with the merger with Warrington. Is that a fait accompli? Is it certain that you will merge with Warrington? Well, obviously, uh, there's a lot of problems to get over. You know, you just can't uh, put a hundred years of tradition uh, and change it overnight. But obviously, uh, I realise, and uh, the board at Witness realise, that uh, Rugby League, uh, if you look beyond Wigan and Leeds, have got tremendous financial problems. And uh, obviously, something had to be done. And uh, I must agree that, uh, you know, we should have uh, grasped this as we have, the new Super League and uh, the money that's involved in it. Uh, the only concern that I do have is that uh, we've actually rushed into the uh, structure of the league. And uh, I thought we might have learned some lessons from rushing into the, uh, the contract system, which caused a lot of trouble. And uh, whilst I agree with the Super League, and it's a, a tremendous thing, and I think it'll be a tremendous success, I uh, do think we should have taken a lot more time over the structure, and our clubs would be involved. Do you feel you've been pressurised into going along with it, for fear of being left out? Well, uh, if you consider that uh, on the Saturday morning, that the Witness Club weren't even involved in the uh, Super League, uh, Super League, and uh, if you if you consider that Witness are the uh, second most successful rugby league club in the last 20 years, uh, well, you know it makes you wonder whether things have been rushed into. Maurice Lindsay, is that a fair comment? How could Witness be left out of a decision of this magnitude? Well, the, the Witness are in for the very fact that uh, Jim uh, spoke from the heart at the Saturday meeting and made a very impassioned plea to all the clubs to consider the the worth of Witness and its historic value. So up until and then, everyone, they were being left out. Well. Mathematically, everyone can't be accommodated, Charles. Quite simply, there are 14 spots in the Super League. Now, how do 35 clubs divide up into 14? You can't do it. 
So y y there have got to be some tiers, there have got to be uh, some casualties along the way. It's mathematically impossible otherwise. Right. Otherwise, we'd just take the money and divide it 35 ways. So there had to be some re rationalisation. But I'm glad that witnesses are going to be involved because Jim was absolutely right when he spoke on Saturday. Tremendous history and it can't be ignored. Thank you for the moment. Let me bring in uh, John Drake, who's a uh, representative of the Rugby League Supporters Association. Um, will the supporters rally round to, to follow these merged clubs, John, do you think? Um, I think that remains to be seen. It depends how the, the mergers take place, if they take place, and how the game's actually taken out to the people. Obviously, it's going to upset a lot of traditional feelings. Supporters have followed the clubs for a very long time. Um, what you have to look at is, is where the game is at the moment and where it's going to go. At the moment, we've got a game that is struggling financially. Clubs are in danger of going to the wall anyway. Um, if mergers um, is a way forward into a Super League that ends up in spreading and promoting the game on a national and international uh, basis, it's something that's got to be looked at. But I think um, it does need to be done with sensitivity if it happens at all. And the danger is that all this talk of mergers is detracting from the other positive benefits of the Super League. Doug Hoyle, MP for Warrington. Your constituents, what do they make of it all? Well, I've been out tonight on the local elections. They don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about what's the future for Warrington. And they're bemused and bewildered. Uh, they, and they're angered as well. They can't understand why Warrington can't stand on their own, if St. Helens can stand on their own, and Halifax can stand on their own. And it's the speed at which this is being taken forward. But will they turn out to support a combined Cheshire team, do you think? Well, it depends where it's cited, and there's a lot to be thought out. But the real big thing is that you've got to ask is, is Murdoch in this for five years, and what happens if he pulls the plug at the end of that? OK, let's go to uh, Nick Grimaldi at the back, Chief Executive of the Players Association. What's the players' point of view on this? Um, the players aren't objecting to change in the game, um, and we support some change to develop the game. The thing that worries the players at the moment is the unanswered questions. Um, clubs join in, what happens to the players' contracts, uh, how many players are misplaced, how many players are going to be out of work. Do you, do you fear that some players will be left well, the, without the game to, be, to play? There has to be, um, if we're joining 26 teams down to 14, that's a number of players who um, have got to find somewhere to play. So somewhere along the line, these professionals are going to be uh, out of work. Okay. Right, well, thanks for the moment. Well, one of the other aspects of this whole scenario is that promotion and relegation has been suspended for the time being. So let's see what they make of that in Keithley, where once again we can join Damien Johnson. Well, a Super League, as we understand it, without Keithley. I'm joined by some of the supporters here at Cougar Park. What's the strength of feeling against that? The feeling's very strong against the Super League, as it doesn't include Keithley but includes p clubs like London, Toulouse, Paris. I mean, the people in Cumbria are not going to go down to Toulouse to watch uh, their team play. It is a however long trip down to the ports down there, then three hours on the, down the motorways to Toulouse. I mean, it is just not going to work that way. If I can turn to you, Paul, the Rugby League will say that, well, the ground simply isn't good enough, despite the hard work that's gone on. Well, already down here, we've got plans for 10,000 people in this stadium. This could be a mega stadium, OK? We've put lots of money in it, vast improvements. Look at the crowd coming in. Yeah, plenty of crowd, plenty of participation. Yes, we need to spend more money on it, but that's what we want. We want to be up there. We want a super stadium for ourselves. We deserve How that. How, if I can move on, how important is Keithley Rugby League Club to the community of Keithley? The community itself revolves around the club because with all the work they do with the schools, the PR they do with everything, the whole town is geared to what Rugby League is. Everybody follows the club home and away. The P, as I say, the PR that the, the players do with schools is all relevant to bringing the development into the town. Without the Super League in Keithley, there will be no town. It will devastate the whole of Keithley. There's no, no argument that this town will go the way of every other town that's lost anything that means anything to it. There's been about 1,500 supporters turned up tonight at a public meeting. What's the thinking been behind that? The thinking been behind it is that we, the supporters, the directors and the players of the club, will fight on until there is absolutely no avenue that can be ex explored to get the club into the Premier League but this club will not in any way, shape or form lie down and die. We will fight on until the end. But as we say, this public meeting tonight has brought out the animosity felt by everybody in this town to the Rugby League's decision that Keithley cannot be in that Premier League. Just moving down the line, where do you go from here in terms of that fight? 
Well, it's up and running now. We've got people. We're going to be sending out faxes, letters, every newspaper in the country, the media, like yourselves. We'll be getting mass petitions going. We'll be getting rallies going. We'll all be going to probably the rugby league headquarters, and we will demand our place. We will demand our place. We deserve it. Just Absolutely moving. Deserve it. Sorry, just moving further along the line. Uh, you clearly feel an injustice has been done. I mean, how confident are you that you can overturn it? Basically, we cannot afford to lose. There's been too much put into the club by the directors, the players, the fans. There's too much at stake to lose out just because of one little Super League. We have got to be in that Super League just to give the club life, basically. That's the position back here at uh, Cougar Park. Back to you, Charles. Cougars! Cougars! Morris Lindsay, do you feel that you're alienating those grassroots supporters? Well, anyone who understands life has got to feel... Um, sympathy for someone who feels that he's losing his, uh, his beloved club. But 35 into 14 won't go. And you've taken a camera to Keithley tonight. You could have taken a camera to York. What about them? You're not taking pity upon them. And they're a wonderful little club with a, with a nice history. Uh, there are so many clubs that you could go to. But the truth is, 1,000 to 5,000 people supporting a club can't keep it alive financially. Keithley have been struggling financially for the last few years during their period of development. But they thought they were on the threshold of great things. Clearly, they, they, they would like to have played Wigan and Leeds and brought their supporters there. But Batley played... Batley are also going to get promoted with Keithley. Batley played Wigan in the Challenge Cup only a few weeks ago, and the crowd was limited to 3,000. And Wigan had to put up a giant screen at Central Park to accommodate five, 6,000 people who couldn't get into the ground. So what's your answer to that? What about the speed at which all this has been arranged? The, you know, the words unseemly haste we, we, we've heard tonight. Do you think it's all happened too quickly? I've rushed around a few interviews and uh, everyone puts that question. Um, sometimes uh, there is unnecessary haste, but sometimes there's necessary haste. And when you're talking about um, an immense sum of money like this, which will rescue the game, it will give clubs who have been struggling and on their uppers, to put it bluntly, very close to liquidation, in fact some of them have gone into liquidation, this will give them the opportunity to really take the game forward. There wasn't a lot of time to make our minds up, things were happening in Australia, we were faced by burning the midnight oil until three o'clock in the morning at Huddersfield on Friday night when all the club chairmen were there, and quite honestly, we, we saw it clearly, we made the decision, and everyone, and you've heard John Wilkinson and Jim Mill speak, everyone is going to stand by that decision. Let's bring in Ray French at this point, BBC Television's commentator on Rugby League. Um, Ray, what do you think about the speed that all this has been put together? Well, the speed has been, I think, with uh, undue haste. And I do think it is a big gamble, a very, very big gamble, because although we are moving from, shall we say, uh, football and competition perhaps with football and uh, big, big uh, rugby union, we are going into competition with probably the big leisure industry. And I think, you know, that is real competition. I think it's a big gamble, but it's a gamble that probably the Rugby League had to take in some form, because whatever sympathy we can put out for clubs like uh, Keithley, Batley and so on, and believe me, I really do have sympathy for those two, the game is stagnating and the crowds just are not there. It's as simple as that. And when people say it could be the death knell of the game, I think the death knell of the game was already being heralded. I think we, we are going down that line. Well, I mean, clearly there is an argument here to be won, and one that understands the way in which it's being put. But surely these things should be argued in a certain way with, with due period of time. John Wilkinson, you've been involved in this thing as well. The impression one gets is that Rugby League has had a, gay, uh, a gun stuck at its head by Mr Murdoch and has, has had no time at all in which to make a considered decision. Well, the decision had to be rushed through, hadn't it? Um, but why? Why so quickly? If it's such a big deal for Mr Murdoch, why, why can't the game in England take its time? Yeah, deals, all good deals are done very, very quickly, aren't they? You know, in business, in life, things happen that way. I suppose Boris would have liked quite a few weeks to sit back and let everybody go to the supporters and the directors and so on, and I think we wouldn't have even got started. And then if Rupert Murdoch would have said, well, I'm sorry, but that's, that deal's not for me, where would the, where would the game have gone? Ian Clayton, let me bring you in at this point. You're a historian, you've written about the game. What do you think of the way things have worked out this weekend? Tears have been coming out of my eyes like the River Calder running down over the last few days. And I don't want to be nostalgic and I don't want to be traditionalist about this because I live at Featherstone and I'd love nothing more than to develop the game and go forward with the game in Featherstone. I'd like somebody, a woman waking up in Toulouse one morning and turning around to her husband and saying, 
Do you fancy a weekend in Featherstone? I'd love that. I'd love that to happen. But I don't want it to happen in this way, in this unduly hasty way. I live on Station Lane in Featherstone. I look out of my living room window. And in the last 10 years, I've seen three pit headgears go. That was the death knell for the village. All the industry went out of the village, followed closely by shops closing down. Shops that had been part and parcel of the, that community fabric for a long time. So is rugby, are you saying rugby league is the latest inevitable victim rugby of a wider latest, agenda? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very valuable community resource in Featherstone. I'm not being traditionalist about Ferguson. I don't want to be nostalgic about Ferguson Rovers. Ferguson Rovers is a proud name with a proud history, just like the Wiggins and, and the Witnesses are. But it's a valuable community resource. When you go up to that Featherstone Stadium and you see everybody from under eights up to academy sides training there, wanting to come from that town, support that team, and you go up on a match day and you sometimes see nearly half the population of a community there, that's very important. And what we've been told about in the last few years is talk about these links between the community and the sport, because that is very, very, very important for rugby league. It's what sets it apart from every other sport. OK, right, thanks for that. Now, that really brings us on to the question of, well, OK, who is running the sport these days if it's not the communities? Is it television? Is it Sky Television? Eddie Hemmings, Sky Television's rugby league commentator. Sky Television, are they too t dominant in the game, do you think? Not at all, and what is more, Sky Television will not be running the game of rugby league. That is Maurice Lindsay's job as chief executive of the Rugby Football League. Uh, let me say right away, Charles, I'm not here tonight to justify Rupert Murdoch's business plan in any way, shape or form. But what I will say is that the way I read it, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the game of rugby league. And it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that was grasped. But we all know that Rupert Murdoch in Australia is, is engaged in a ferocious battle with Kerry Packer for the control of the rugby league rights down there. Could it be that the game in England has become a weapon to be used in an Australian civil war? I think the Australian civil war, again if the information I'm receiving from down under is correct, will soon be over. Um, that might not then be the case that the money would have been on the table for the game in this country. I, as I say, I can't answer that. But this was a, a chance that Maurice Lindsay and the Rugby Football League were in the box seat. They were the people, who I think, who were sorting out this contract from a very strong position on Saturday. I wonder whether the position would have been as strong, say, next Saturday or the Saturday after. Jim Mills, what do you think about that? Do you think that maybe we are bit part players in, in Rupert Murdoch's grand battle plan in Australia? Well, obviously, uh, things have moved so fast over this weekend and it's been going on a lot longer in Australia that uh, eventually it was bound to reach these shores uh, because, after all, it's a world game. And uh, obviously, uh, who knows what's uh, been happening uh, up there in the uh, major offices in New York and whatnot. Uh, obviously, uh, we uh, had to, uh, to grasp this while it was there. Uh, you know, uh, it, it could be said that, uh, you know, as I've said before, our game was dying and uh, we've had to grasp this opportunity, but uh, as I've said before, uh, we should have uh, just taken our time over it. OK, well, let's reflect on the fact that uh, we've been talking maybe about the downside of the whole issue uh, so far, but of course it is, it is a great chance as well for the game. Joe Lydon of Wigan. Wigan have been at the apex of the game for so long that they've run out of people who can realistically beat them. So what does this mean for a club like Wigan? I think we're in a luxury position at the moment. Obviously, we've had the success and enjoyed success over the few years. I think what we have to remember, and I think what everybody would agree here, is that we have the product. Rugby League is a great product. We have had difficulty promoting it in the proper way that it deserves of late. Um, but the game is there to be shown, and I think the chance had to come along. We needed an injection of, of money uh, and the right way to promote it, and possibly this is it. But again, I, I am concerned that maybe it's a little bit hasty that things haven't been worked out right, maybe the chance hasn't been there to work them out right. And I do feel uh, concerned for clubs, especially ones that have to merge, and teams that are in the second division. Which People, of course include your former club witness. That's right. Um, I know it's going to be very hard. Fans are very, very loyal and, and have the right to their own clubs and, and really feel that they belong to the community. So it's OK for Wigan, who have enjoyed the success, but I, um, I do feel for the, for the smaller clubs. Do you think possibly w Wigan would have begun to stagnate if the situation had not received this, this radical input? I don't think so. I think um, um, Wigan, uh, people say that we've had a lot of success, and we have, but um, the gap isn't that wide. Um, we, we've managed to stay on top of the pile, but it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very close fought race. 
OK, let's go to a current player, Bruce Maguire of Warrington, who's also an official with the Players Association. Um, what do you feel about this? Have you mixed feelings? Just, <clears throat> just in the sense that, you know, obviously Warrington are going to be mixed uh, amalgamated next year. So it, it just leaves me in a situation of, um, personally, you know, what, what really goes on. But I'm sure there's going to be quite a few players in that situation as well. It's going to be surely an opportunity for the players who are still involved to take a lot more out of the game in terms of the, the pay packets, bonuses, things like that. Well, you hope so. You just hope it isn't going to be, you know, the top 10 percent. You know, obviously it, it can't. So hopefully, um, you know, with a package like this, the players that are involved in the Super League will be able to make a, a living out of it and sort of, um, which you probably have to be, you know, if you're travelling down to France sort of every you know, a couple of weeks to sort of play and off there, you won't be able to hold a steady job. So, obviously, they, these things have to be looked at and sort of, uh, it's been very quickly put into, in, into place, but there's, there's quite a few issues that, from players' point of view, that have to sort of sit down and be discussed. Kevin Ashcroft, former coach with Salford and, uh, and Warrington. Um, what do, you, do you see this as a brave new era? Yeah, I do. I think something had to happen. Uh, I do feel sorry for your Featherstones and your Keithleys. Uh, I think... Uh, like I've returned to Jim before and to merge with Warrington, I mean, the two whole clubs merging, it's like asking Russia and Germany to fight together in a war, isn't it? I can't imagine that ever happening. Uh, I just think they will lose a lot of spectators from that point of view. I think one thing that's not been mentioned here, of course, is the money involved. I think it's 1.1 million for the Super League. They will get over... Every, for each club per each season. Each club per season, which is fine. That will definitely, you know, generate good players, the best players, and it should improve the game, without a question of doubt. It should bring the levels together. But as far as this, the, it's going to be called the first division, I think they get a £100,000 payoff. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that is the death knell for that division. Uh, right. There's no way they're going to be able to compete. The, the right, gap well, is going to go wider. I think at this point, we'll, we'll go back to Keithley, because quite clearly this is an issue which directly affects the Cougars, who are expected to, to win promotion at the end of this season. So we'll rejoin Damien Johnson. Here at Cougar Park, I'm joined by Mick O'Neill, the chairman of Keithley, and Steve Ball from Batley. Mick, the fight obviously on to uh, get Keithley into this uh, Super League. Yes. What developments today? Developments today is that we've been down to London. We've seen a top barrister who looked after Tottenham Hotspurs and got them in the uh, league and they're back and obviously you know the success of them. He's uh, told us that uh, everything is, uh, is right if we want to sue Rugby League. Uh, we don't want to go down that avenue if we can help it. Uh, all I want for this club is to get in the Super League. I'm not bothered about the money. I'm bothered about Mr Murdoch's one million when we get in the Super League to have a super team in Keithley. I suppose there's a sense of deja vu because Keithley were in a very similar position a few years ago. Why does it always happen to us? Every time we get somewhere and some success, the first time in 90 years we, had a, we got a trophy and then they abandoned the, the, the third division. So we'll end up in the second division with everybody else. We're there again, right at the top, and bang. And it's not fair. This club deserve success. We've worked hard, the spectators have worked hard. It isn't directors and, and them and us and all this sort of thing. We're all one, the players, everybody in this club have joined together and it's tremendous and we've got, these people need success and I do as well and we want the success and we want to be a super club. Dare I say it, there's been a lot of talk about mergers. Some people might say, why don't you simply join with Bradford? Yeah, well that's... Uh, no, I mean, that, <laughs> that, speak, that speaks for itself. Uh, what you can hear in the background. But Mr. Kaisley has said already that he's nearer Halifax than, he, than, than Keithley. Uh, and luckily, we are that far apart. Uh, there's, no, there's no loyalty between Keithley and, and, and Bradford. And I'm so pleased that we haven't joined with them. Now, we're only 100 yards from North Yorkshire, and this is what we should be doing, that Keithley should represent North Yorkshire, there's nobody, nobody representing them, and we should be representing North Yorkshire by ourselves as a super club, and then, the, then we turn over Bradford. If I can turn to you, Steve Ball, the chairman of Batley, Batley on the brink of promotion as well, what's your position? Our position is quite clear, we're here to defend the integrity of Rugby League, the very foundations on which it was built upon, a sense of justice, a sense of fairness, and as far as we're concerned, Batley and Keithley have earned the right to be in the Premier League next season. That's a right that's been earned. And it's not for people in a room at Wigan to decide who should be in next season's Premiership. We've earned the right over six years. We've earned the right on the pitch. I'm not here to, to, to make Batley's case forward. I'm here to rep represent Rugby League itself 
to represent rugby league people, but more important, we're, the game's under the, under the microscope now, the integrity's at stake. I'm saying these are the very foundations, integrity, fairness, those are what the, the game was built on. This game is built on justice, and we're here to make sure that justice is applied to Batley and Keithley. We've earned the right to compete in the Premier League next season, and I don't want anybody to take that away from us. In Obviously, views that go down very well. Obviously, views that go down very well, but in the interest of justice, is a Super League the right thing for the game? Whether a Super League's the right thing for the game is a different question altogether. We're talking about what's right and wrong. A Super League may well be the way forward for the game itself to play, big teams in big stadiums. But the game has a history, and the game has a history of community clubs, of being fair to each other and not slitting each other's throat when it suits. I'm saying to, to the Rugby League and to the sports media, if Batley and Keighley or any other club have earned the right at the start of the season to play a full season, to play in next year's Premiership, Premier League, they deserve the right to compete in that, whether it's for half a season or a full season. Yes. Steve Ball and uh, Mick O'Neill from Keighley. Strong views indeed. Back to you, Charles. OK, thanks very much. Well, one thing we haven't spoken about so far is the switch to the summer season. Ray French, what do you think about switching from winter to summer? Well, personally, I've not been a lover of switching from uh, winter to summer. I I'm not really convinced, Charles, that uh, people are going to flock in droves when uh, it's high temperatures and uh, Southport, Blackpool or Alton Towers uh, calls. But again, I do believe something had to be done and I'm prepared um, to, see it, uh, to see it happen. I'm prepared to give it my support, although I have a gut feeling that people who watch rugby when the weather isn't good enough to go anywhere else. Eddie Hemmings, do you think that in any way it was a condition of the deal that it should switch to the summer? I think the condition of the deal probably was that the two seasons on both sides of the world would dovetail because I think the overall plan is for this to become a, a global operation some way down the track. Um, Ray, I think, is probably a, one of the lone voices these days about summer rugby. There has been a snowball running downhill for the past six months summer rugby suddenly has become the number one topic in the game and summer rugby it appeared to me after last week's meeting was an inevitability ian clayton you've got the traditions of the game very much uh, engraved on on your heart what do you think about playing in june featherstone won't be playing at all by the sound of it will they i mean the main the main priority for me is to keep rugby in my community now if it has to go to summer rugby then it'll have to go to it'll have to go to summer rugby but i think the summer rugby issue is, is an entirely different kettle of fish, and I think it's a little red herring that's been drawn across the track. Oh, well, John, John Drake of the Rugby League Supporters Association, presumably we're looking here for the summer to bring additional crowds out, for there to be some sort of a net gain. Will it happen? Um, that remains to be seen. I w personally speaking, I wasn't in favour of, of the initial switch to summer that was being proposed, basically because I had a feeling it was to cover up the fact that many rugby league grounds aren't fit to accommodate people in poor weather conditions, um, and it was going to cover up that aspect of it. What we're seeing with the Super League is a whole change in, in the total concept of what rugby league's about. So maybe the switch to summer if it's done correctly, if the Super League takes off, and if the marketing, promotion and development all comes together, it may be a success. And I think what we should do is have a little bit more confidence in our sport. Instead of saying um, people might be more keen to go to Blackpool, Alton Towers or whatever, we've got to make Rugby League into the place where people want to go at the weekend. OK, well, I'm sure Maurice Lindsay would go along with that. Maurice, I know you want to come back and what, what was said at Keithley, but uh, just before that, uh, the summer rugby argument uh, there has been this debate, which Eddie mentioned. You're obviously now convinced that this is part of the way forward. Yes. Um, we didn't know that the offer was going to come forward from News Corporation, uh, and we still had a debate lined up for summer rugby. And clubs that were putting that forward and were supporting it were including people like Bradford, Wigan, very wholeheartedly from Jack Robinson, um, other clubs, Oldham particularly. Uh, many clubs wanted summer rugby to take place because they felt that the players weren't being given a chance to totally display their skills and this winter has been so dreadful we've had more postponed matches than ever I think the players themselves wanted it uh, we took a straw poll amongst leading players and indeed other players and they were all unitedly for it and you're right I'd like to comment on what Stephen said very quickly very disappointed with Stephen Ball he was on the board of directors last year and uh, he told us that Doncaster would be a success we 
uh, reserve the view that Doncaster would struggle. He was wrong and we are right and he's playing on emotions once again. So, a final comment then, this is the way forward for the game, no regrets? It has to be the way forward, you've got to be brave. If Featherstone could get enough people to financially sustain that club, we'd keep them as they are. The truth is that Featherstone have been close to bankruptcy and that's a fact. I know that when they bought Mark Aston, a cheque for Mark Aston bounced, did not clear the bank. That's a fact that cannot be denied. That's all across the game. Let's face facts, let's be realistic, and let's not, not be chewed up by Stephen Ball playing on people's emotions. So Morris Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you very much. We'll have to leave it at that point. Well, we're 100 years on from the foundation of the Rugby Football League, and the game is preparing to celebrate by holding the World Cup in England in the autumn. But it looks as though the centenary will be significant in more ways than one, not just as a milestone, but a finishing post and a new start. That job. So let's look first at Uranus. Voyager 2 sent back the first good pictures of the thin, narrow ring system. We knew it existed, but the rings of Uranus can't in any way be compared with the lovely system of Saturn. And bear in mind, too, that because of this remarkable axial inclination, as the probe went into Uranus, it went in more or less...